So my name is uh, Peter Hall, and it's uh, my pleasure to <clears throat> my pleasure to welcome you all to the uh, third uh, Guido Goldman lecture on Germany. I was just thinking as I came into the room that the last time I was in this room, I was lecturing to a class of undergraduates with a colleague, and when he was lecturing, I was able to sit in the um, chairs and realized that half the students were surfing the web. Many of them were actually shopping during the lecture. So <laughs> I hope only a few of you are going to be doing that uh, today. Uh, and before going further, let me say uh, that everyone here is invited back uh, to the Minden de Gunsberg Center for European Studies after uh, this event. Uh, it's just across the street. I think many of you know where it is. Uh, you're welcome uh, for refreshments and indeed for the unveiling of this remarkable collection of art that Guido Goldman has uh, left, uh, generously left to the center. So this lecture was established uh, to honor the contributions of Guido Goldman uh, to promoting the study of Germany and uh, transatlantic relations, both at Harvard and in the United States more generally. Uh, Guido passed away uh, two years ago uh, this month uh, and the talk today is part of a larger uh, tribute to Guido's life. Uh, and indeed, we're very happy to have Martin Klingst here, who is the author of a new biography of Guido. Um, that's the full, uh, picture from the cover. And uh, CES has said to me that um, if there are any students here, and I'm sure everyone here is a student of life, uh, who would like a copy of the biography, there are copies that you can ask at the Center for European Studies during the reception. And, uh, and we're very grateful to Martin for the biography, most of all, but also for being here. So with Stanley Hoffman, uh, Guido was one of the founders of the Minda de Gunsberg Center uh, for European Studies, and he served wisely as its director uh, for many years. Uh, as many people here know, uh, Guido was also a transatlantic uh, statesman, instrumental in raising endowments not only for the Center for European Studies, but also uh, for the German Marshall Fund, a critical pillar of transatlantic uh, relations uh, and understanding in the United States. Uh, and as many people here know, and as uh, uh, some of my friends and colleagues have uh, said uh, at the lunch that preceded this, uh, Guido was a remarkable man, uh, a brilliant strategist, uh, and a great friend to so many of us. Uh, today would have been his 85th birthday, uh, and we miss him deeply. But there can be no more appropriate speaker for this event uh, than Dr. Constanze Stelzenmuller. Uh, Dr. Stelzenmuller uh, herself has been an important contributor to transatlantic understanding uh, for many years. She holds degrees from the University of Bonn and the Harvard Kennedy School. From 1994 to 2005, she was defense and uh, security editor for the German weekly uh, Die Zeit. Uh, and over the past 30 years, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, her essays and articles have appeared in many influential publications from Foreign Affairs, the Washington Post, uh, to the Financial Times, for which she uh, still uh, currently writes a monthly column. Uh, Dr. Sensa Muir has served as a trans senior transatlantic uh, fellow with the German Marshall Fund. She's held the Kissinger Chair at the Library of Congress. She was the inaugural Robert Bosch Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, and she is currently at Brookings, uh, the director of their Center on the United States and uh, Europe. And she's the inaugural holder of the Fritz Stern Chair on Germany and Transatlantic Relations. Uh, the topic on which uh, Dr. Uh, Selsenmuller is going to speak could hardly be uh, more important. Its title is uh, The Free World and Its Enemies, uh, What Putin's War and China's uh, Global Ambitions uh, Mean for Us. Uh, Dr. Celsi Mueller, it's an honor for us to have you. Uh, I know how much uh, Guido would have liked to have heard your remarks. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, I have to tell you, the honor is all mine. Dear Jegos, dear Elaine, dear Peter Hall, um, dear Charles and Alexander de Gunsberg, um, dear friends of Guido Goldman and dear students who don't know him yet, um, it is an immense honor to give this lecture, the third lecture, and also the memorial lecture for Guido on what would have been his 85th birthday today. And um, I have to say this auditorium is filled um, with so many of his friends um, that I stand here with some trepidation. 
In particular, I see people in this room who'd be at least as qualified or more than I to give this speech, among them his lifelong friend, Karl Kaiser, Thomas kleine Bochow, I can't, I'm amazed that you've managed to fit yourself into that extremely uncomfortable looking chair. Um, and Martin Klingst, who indeed wrote Guido's really great biography that you see up here, do read it. And Thomas, of course, uh, dedicated his book, Die Welt braucht den Westen, um, The World Needs the West, to the man he called his fatherly friend in the preface. And there are many more. Please consider me as speaking on all of your behalf, and if not, I understand there's a discussion period afterwards, and of course, we'll all have wine later at CS, and then you can really lay into me. I also want to say I'm really grateful to Charles de Gunsberg um, for tearing up at the lunch just now, because that makes me feel much better. I have two problems when I speak about people that I loved. Um, one is I talk very, very fast in general, and so please wave and at me if I hit, you know, Martu. Uh, and I will try to slow down again. Uh, and the other thing is, I, I am, as, as Germans say, nah am Wasser gebaut, um, build close to the water. Uh, I tear up, so I feel much, I feel much more relaxed about that now. Um, it was a very, very moving lunch with really fabulous tributes. And I was actually considering um, dropping a lot of the personal stuff that I had written into my speech. Um, but since there are so many students here whom I'm guessing didn't know him, I think I, I may actually leave some of that back in because I think it's important that you understand what kind of a person this was. Um, Guido was indeed a builder of bridges, especially for a generation of post-war German politicians for whom he, he opened doors in Washington and thereby also helping to smooth the path of reconciliation and trust building between Germany and its former enemies. He was a builder of institutions, the German Marshall Fund. I'm really glad that you spoke about that. And, and Harvard's Minda de Gunsberg Center, which he co-founded with Henry Kissinger and Stanley Hof Hoffman, both owe their existence to him. He was on the boards of the American Council in Germany and the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. And he was such an Olympic level fundraiser for Harvard, his New York Times obituary said 75 million, that they gave him a medal for his efforts. <laughs> and along the way, he also built collections such as his strikingly beautiful um, Uzbek ikats, which now hang in several museums. But as many said at lunch today, Guido was above all a collector of people, a cultivator of deep and lasting friendships. He, who, as you said, Charles, had no biological children, was a parent to multitudes, beginning, I think, with his father, his mother, his brother, and as he liked to note, even his father's, his father's mistresses <laughs> after his father's death. Um, he was a lifelong confidant to fellow Harvard alum Henry Kissinger and a devoted friend to fellow faculty members like Hoffman, but also to the Alvin Ailey dance troupe, some of whose dancers became a part of his life too. And he kept close track of the trajectories of the, the Kennedy School of McCloy Fellows, another creation of his, which is how I was inducted into what I think we now need to call the Fellowship of Guido. He visited us, invited us to his homes in Concord, Florida, took, it out, took us out to dinner, read what we wrote, wanted to hear what we thought, and told us what he had heard and read. And if we were in Washington around early February, he took immense pleasure in inviting us all to the Ailey Gala, where all of Washington turned out in their best and finest, followed by dinner on the roof where you would find yourself seated between dancers, politicians, and civil rights icons. It was just astounding. And we were all dazzled by the breadth of Guido's knowledge, his interests, his passions, his marvelous fluency as a raconteur, and yes, that massive frame, the flashing eyes and the charismatic grin that made him a room-filling presence even into his high old age. His parents, Alice Gottschalk and Nahum Godman, God, uh, Godman <coughs> then still with two N, uh, had escaped the menacing tide of National Socialism to America with their two small sons in 1940. Guido grew up in a wealthy and cultured, if not perhaps that warm, household on the Upper West Side of New York. As the son of a father who was co-founder of the World Jewish Congress and the president of the World Zionist Organization, and later he made his own fortune and built institutions in his own right. He moved at ease among the rich and influential because he was one of them. But as many of us have caused to know, and many have said this morning, Guido's most admirable traits were veiled in discretion. He was deeply committed to civil rights, to racial equality and the arts, and he supported them quietly, loyally, and generously. He was an astute judge of character, but the harshest comment he would permit himself was disappointing. He would have thought it vulgar to dwell on his own vulnerabilities, but the better one knew him, the more carefully one listened to his silences. Guido's empathy and his kindness were all the more notable 
and seemingly endless. Many who were lonely, sad, or in need in due course found themselves noticed, understood, and helped. He was a good man. But I have another mission today besides eulogizing our friend, and that is to talk about Germany, the country which was so close to Guido Goldman's heart, so much so that he endowed this lecture series to last beyond his passing. And why, you might ask, of all places, Germany? For a later born Gentile, this is dangerous ground, Femintus Gelände, as we say, but I'm German, so I'm obviously going to go there. <laughs> Guido himself was born in Switzerland, but his father Nahum, born in what is now Belarus in Vishnevo, as you said, Karl, had come to live with family in Frankfurt as a child, and his wife Alice was born in Berlin. In his biography of Guido, Martin Klingst cites a family friend, Avram Udovich, as saying that the older Goldmans never quite managed to unlove the country that broke their heart and would surely have killed them had they stayed. The historian Amos Elun, in his canonical study of Jews in Germany, the pity of it all, <coughs> describes the bafflement and incredulity that caused so many, think Professor Klemperer, Klemperer, Victor Klemperer in Dresden, to stay behind their desperate conviction that it just could not be. Elon quotes Victor Klemperer's anguished diary entry at the end of his book, quote, I am German forever, a German nationalist. The Nazis are un-German, sie sind undeutsch. Weil nicht sein kann, das nicht sein darf. That which must not, cannot be, wrote the German poet Christian Morgenstern in 1909 in a humorous poem whose last stanza many Germans can recite by heart. In it, the poet's alter ego, the melancholy eccentric Panström, is hit by a car in a street crossing. He retreats, as one does as a German, to a library, studies the law book, and concludes to hit a pedestrian with a car as against the rules. So it must all have been a dream. Weil nicht sein kann, must nicht sein darf, that which must not be, cannot be. It is one of the most perceptive one-liners about Germans ever written. And Guido himself was never other than clear-eyed about Germany's past and the shadows it cast over the present. The horrific crimes of the Nazi era, the airbrushing of history by the young West German Republic, whose leaders, leaders were eager to strike a deal in reparations with his father Nahum so they could get on with rebuilding the country the slow and reluctant recognition over decades of the breadth and depth of so many Germans' guilt and responsibility for the Holocaust, the desperate desire to be forgiven of those who had neither acknowledged nor atoned. Did Guido ever forgive? I can tell you I would not have dared to ask, even when I was good friends with him, and indeed, why should he have? I think it is because Guido was so clear-eyed that his nurturing of post-war generations of German leaders was such an act of generosity. And if I may hazard a guess, it was also an aristocratic refusal to let himself or his relationship with the country of his parents defined by what that country had tried to do to them. We owe him, I owe him, gratitude for his faith in us and his hope for a country. And I was, of course, far too much in awe of Guido when I came to Harvard in 1986 as a McCloy Fellow in my early 20s to seek conversation with him, much less his friendship. But because I was doing doctoral research on direct democracy and US constitutional law, I was drawn into the natural force field of Judith Schlar, then already a renowned political philosopher and the first woman to have tenure at, the, at Harvard's government department. She was, as I was only to realize much later, a friend of Guido's and like him, a Jewish refugee from Nazi Europe. I was interested in referenda and direct democracy because there seemed to be a crisp democratic morning wind blowing in Europe. She made it clear, severely but not unkindly, that I was being naive. <laughs> I only understood much later that her birthplace, Riga, then newly independent but soon to be, when she was born, but soon to be occupied by the Soviet Union in 1940 might have something to do with that. But when Judith Klar Professor Schlar, as we all called her, um, spoke in class about the tyranny of the majorities and the, the necessity of limited government and the dispersion of power to prevent it. I knew very viscerally what she meant and was talking about and sometimes wondered whether my American classmates understood that in quite the same way as I did. In her famous essay, The Liberalism of Fear, published in 1989, she wrote, and I quote, Liberalism, liberalism's deepest grounding is in place from the first in the conviction of the earliest defenders of toleration, born in horror, that cruelty is an absolute evil, an offense against God or humanity. And she knew, of course, what she was talking about. But then the Berlin Wall came down. 
history was ending. Liberal democracy would surely spread around the world, remember? And I went home to Germany. Guido Goldman's German optimism, it seemed to me, had won out over Judith Schlar's Baltic skepticism. And 16 years passed after my departure from Cambridge in 1989 until I encountered Guido again at the German Marshall Fund where Guido was the board co-chair. And by the times I had arrived at Brookings in 2014, I had somehow been folded into the extended Goldman flock. Unfortunately, the heady promise of the early 1990s had become a faraway memory, and the jarring shocks of what we learned to call the poly crisis were accelerating. The global financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis, the annexation of Crimea by Russia and its proxy war in Donbass, the migration crisis, the rise of populism, the surge of the hard right AFD in Germany, and finally the pandemic, and of course the election of a populist president in America. Guido was deeply worried, as has been referenced a number of times this morning, anguished even about all these developments, and his conversations with us became much more somber. Guido died on November 30th, 2020, in the midst of a shockingly turbulent and contested presidential election aftermath. And a few days later, Elaine Papoulias called me to say that he'd wanted me to give this memorial lecture. And it felt a little bit like being summoned once more by Guido to one of his conversations. Invariably at a very nice restaurant where he would look around the table and at the food and say expansively, isn't this great? <laughs> then he would fix out you with his expressive dark eyes and say, so explain to me why this is happening. I'm sure you all remember that. So Guido, here I am. This is supposed to be a lecture about Germany, I know, but we are living in one of those rare historic moments in which a discrete regional event has rippled around the world with that yet, as yet entirely unpredictable outcomes and consequences and become the filter through, through which we assess almost everything else, a bit like the fall of the wall. Germany, of course, is a key player in this story, but I must begin elsewhere with the return of war to Europe on February 24th and what it means for the free world. And in time-honored think-tanking mode, I will do this in the form of seven propositions and cap each one with a statement of what we need to do. Actually, the German proposition, the seventh one, will have a couple more than one. Firstly, 354 days into Russia's three-day invasion, the war has reached a potentially climactic moment. The Ukrainians are making a heroic push to throw the invaders back towards their southern and eastern borders before the onset of winter. And while Putin's troops are struggling on the battlefield, he is attempting to regain the upper hand by doubling down with ferocious strength and determination elsewhere. Annexing territory, bombing power plants and cities across Ukraine with the help of Iranian drones and threatening to use nuclear weapons. The Kremlin is, of course, using terror to angle for negotiations while publicly denying any such intent. But, of course, purely on its terms, and with only one goal, Ukraine's capitulation and its extinction as a sovereign culture and nation. Now, obviously, there must be negotiations at some point. But on Ukraine's terms and at a time of Ukraine's choosing, and I would put to you that that can only happen once Russia no longer believes it can win the war militarily. There is no other way Ukraine will be safe. And I have a hard time imagining that the chief negotiator for Russia at that time will be the war criminal who is its current president. My guess, however, is that he still believes at this point that time and winter are on his side and that he can deplete, exhaust, and paralyze Ukraine and its Western supporters. So here comes my first proposition. We must give Ukraine what it needs to defend itself without delay and increase sanctions even more on Russia. Secondly, we, Ukraine's allies, do not see ourselves as parties to this conflict, but Putin does. We have been exquisitely careful in drawing our red lines for the Kremlin. And in this, the Biden administration and the German government have been very much in sync, interestingly. We're helping Ukraine, and we are constraining Russia with sanctions of unparalleled severity, yet we will not engage at, as combatants for good reasons. Putin, however, has been waging quote-unquote, measures short of war against all of us for the past decade or more. He's been conducting influence operations, probing our vulnerabilities, and ensnaring us into dependencies. He has deployed propaganda, disinformation, as well as material support for hard-right parties and movements in order to destabilize and delegitimize our democracies, and he has weaponized our reliance on Russian fuels. 
But he sees his war with Ukraine, to quote my Brookings colleague Fiona Hill, as a, quote, full-on war with the West, unquote. That was made clear to the world on December 17th of last year. On that date, the Kremlin sent identical treaty drafts to the White House and to NATO headquarters for immediate signature, as they said. Their thrust was nothing less than the rollback of, Western Euro of, of democratic transformation in Eastern Europe, the neutralization of Western Europe, and the departure of America from the continent. Putin is in a war with us, whether we like it or not. And so that is the reason why we must urgently see to our own deterrence, defense, and resilience, and God knows there's a lot of work to do. Thirdly, and I hate to get, you know, draw this in even more into darkness, but needs must. Thirdly, we are nowhere near the end of this conflict, maybe at the end of the beginning, at best. Putin may be running out of ammunition, but he's not run out of options to escalate or to broaden the scope of this war. In a brazenly cynical reversal, re reversal of the facts, he continues to cast his invasion of Ukraine, the ravaging of its agriculture and the strangulation of its ports as Western depredations on the poor of the world. More recently, it appears that he might be adding sabotage against our critical infrastructure, pipelines, undersea cables, optical cables, satellites, to his arsenal. This is a war that will continue to be waged on multiple vectors and in multiple domains and dimensions within the West and around the globe. In Putin's mind, and in fact, I think, this is already a global war. So what we have to do is to prepare for a long, complex, and drawn-out twilight struggle. So that is where we are. Fourth, Allied cohesion is being brutally tested on multiple fronts. Yes, Putin's war unexpectedly revived the transatlantic alliance, NATO, the EU, even the United Nations, and the International Criminal Court, which, both of which had been in seemingly terminal decline. Finland and Sweden are joining the alliance. Ukraine and Moldova have been promised EU membership. Japan and Korea, South Korea, <laughs> are supporting Western sanctions. 143 countries voted yes on a UN resolution on condemning Russia's aggression. But that strength and unity is offset by tremendous counter forces. China, of course, is refusing to condemn the Kremlin as in f and it is in fact supporting its narratives, working hard to message European audiences that they are being used by the United States. Also keen on Western middle powers, India, South Africa, Mexico, the Gulf states are acting as swing states by hedging or playing both sides. So in fact is a major NATO country, Turkey. On this point, Julia Friedlander, a former US government official who now directs the Atlantic Brücke in Berlin, has made a, an astute observation. It is the fact that the conflict between Russia and the West is centered in the economic and financial sphere by us that has, and I quote, elevated the role of middle powers, each using the fallout to advance their specific interests so far with considerable success, full stop. And she adds, quote, the more complicated the web of well-leveraged into global actors, the harder it is to establish and defend global norms from WTO, WTO reform to data protection to price setting of commodities, unquote. Among the G7 in NATO and the EU, of course, concerns over the resilience of public support for Ukraine fuels disagreements over sharing the burden of assistance and over the nature and timing of an acceptable end state for the conflict. The Biden administration's climate le legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the CHIPS Act are fueling fears in Europe and counter threats of a, trans of a transatlantic trade war and an economic war on China. And of course, within our Western democracies, divisions and domestic strains are increasingly apparent as well. Spiking inflation, energy prices, make the cost of sanctions personal to consumers already spooked by the three-year pandemic. Another summer of record heat, droughts, and forest fires has driven home the risk of delaying climate change mitigation. The narrow re-election in France of Emmanuel Macron, the revolving door in Downing Street, the ascent to power of hard-right parties in Italy and Sweden are undercutting the foreign policy bandwidth of key European governments. And finally, and we know that Guido would be worrying about this particularly, the next Tuesday's midterms. Here in the United States could see the Democrats losing both houses of Congress among p persistent criticism of the Biden administration's engagement in Ukraine by the left, by centrist restrainers, and the MAGA right. That could mean gridlock and impeachments at the federal level, but worse by far is the specter of state-level candidates who are already 
who are still denying the legitimacy of the last election or asserting the right for state capitals to decree the outcome of the next one. That could determine the outcome, the further course of American history. Or in President Biden's stark words on Wednesday night, in our bones we know that democracy is at risk. I don't know about you, but I feel it that way. So perhaps unsurprisingly, the good editors at Collins Dictionary have chosen permacrisis as their word of the year. The term is not new, of course, but highlighting it now is helpful because it forces us to take our eyes off the policy level and acknowledge that we may not just be looking at systemic competition as the West strategy documents have it now, but at chaotic interdependence, perhaps even an emerging systemic crisis rife for exploitation by authoritarians, warlords, and criminals. I am permitting myself to hope that free democracies are more resilient and authoritarians more fragile than they often look. But it also seems to me that the burden of proof for that thesis is on us. Fifth, Germany's director of domestic intelligence, Thomas Haldenwang, recently startled the German public somewhat by warning Russia is the storm, China is climate change. But really, the worst case for Europe is a strategic ice age. In it, we would not be a subject, but an object of great power competition. Yes, our economic power has been a genuine source of, re of leverage for the Biden administration and recognized by it as essential to their strategic interests and not just a sort of boutique add-on like our military capabilities. But we have been given a deeply sobering lesson in the limits and shortcomings of European power. We have every reason to be grateful for the Biden administration's muscular and remarkably patient and collaborative leadership. Without it, Ukraine and Europe would be infinitely more exposed to the Russian storm. But there are some what-ifs that we must urgently consider. What if America turns away because it must deal with an even more urgent crisis in the Taiwan Strait? Or because it demands that we deal with Russia on our own? Or becomes hostile to Europe again? What if Ukraine is defeated? That would create a huge failed state, a shameful humanitarian disaster, and a source of pers persistent insecurity on our doorsteps. As for Russia, unless it abandons its imperial delusions and adopts a decent form of internal governance, I know a dream on, it is on a downward trajectory for the foreseeable future. It too could become a failing great power, and at the very least an, en an enduring challenge, if not a constant threat to European security. And China, of course, is watching Russia's war and the West's defense of Ukraine very carefully. It is pursuing a strategy of global preeminence and seeks to impose its own version of global order through creating dependencies on its own. And it is working hard to split Europe off the US. So what we must do here is close ranks, be responsible allies, bear a greater share of the transatlantic burden of constraining Russia, and reduce and mitigate our dependence on China. Sixth, and this is where I come back to the title of my lecture, enmity has returned to the post-Cold War world. The title of my lecture, The Free World and Its Enemies, is of course a reference to Karl Popper's The Open Society and Its Enemies. And I was somewhat startled to hear that Putin in his recent Valdai speech referenced Popper as well. It's a bit disturbing. Um, it takes inspiration from the virtues that Popper identifies as foundational for life in a liberal and open society, a commitment to reason and criticism as well as opposition to essentialism, determinism, and totalitarianism. All things that I think Guido stood for and believed in deeply as well. That commitment, I want to argue, implies that liberal democracies should stand together to defend their societies and each other against aggressively revisionist authoritarians. Another colleague of mine, Thomas Wright, wrote in 2018 that, quote, Russia and China are very different powers with very different strategies, but they share the objective of targeting free and open societies to make the world a safer place for authoritarianism, end quote. What he had in mind, of course, was the you know, interference along the gamut of political meddling to co economic coercion. Few of, us, few of us, certainly not I, were, had the imagination to envisage the savage, sadistic war that Russia has been waging on its peaceful neighbor since February 24th. 
And that brings me to the problem of the enemy, a category that, I th that we thought we had driven a stake through, fumigated, festooned with garlic, and buried after 1989, right? Mm -hmm. But just as Carl Schmitt is preeminent theorist, also a critic of liberal modernity, devoted enabler of the Third Reich, and a virulent anti-Semite, keeps haunting debates on international relations like a zombie, I fear we must contemplate the return of en enmity. And let me explain what I mean by that before you think I've gone entirely off the deep end. To be precise, we, the free democracies, must face the fact that we have adversaries who consider us as enemies. To be even more precise, they consider us as absolute enemies in the manner defined by Schmidt in the concept of the political. Quote, existentially different and alien, unquote. And as Schmidt explains, it is the essence of the absolute enemy that he cannot be negotiated with. There is no compromise. Quote, war follows from enmity. War is the existential negation of the enemy. That framing is now familiar to us as part of the ideological arsenal deployed against liberal modernity by the ethno-nationalist hard right in America and in Europe, right? And one of the most frightening aspects of its normalization, and one that Guido was deeply concerned about, is its slide from culture war to actual violence. And we saw its apogee for now on January 6th. And the other actor who, speaks, who thinks and speaks in those terms is, of course, Vladimir Putin. His frequent characterization of Ukrainian leaders as Nazis, the litany of far-right tropes about the corrupt, arrogant, and decadent West in his Valdai speech last week, his rants about Satanism, and the need to purify Russia from scum and traitors su suggest that Putin is, well, a Schmittian. Now, this could just be CD personal obsessions. It could also be part of his strategy to terrify, into a, to terrify us into paralysis, deliberately conjuring of the ghosts of Europe's darkest past, right? But what if he means it both seriously and literally? Certainly his mode of war suggest that that is something we should not exclude. That then would not be a strategic competition, it would be a zero-sum game, and at the very least, we should be prepared to respond to such an eventuality. So, free democracies must be prepared to, for adversaries who see us as enemies. Seventh, no country in Europe is as vulnerable and underprepared for all of this as Germany. But what you and everybody else and their great, great aunt ask of the Zeitenwende, what of the Zeitenwende, the turning point promised by Chancellor Olaf Scholz in his historic speech on February 27th? I've come to think of it as Schrödinger's Zeitenwende. It is, and yet is not. To be fair, Scholz deserves credit for reframing Germany's national conversation on security and defense on that day. I'm grateful to younger social democrats like party co-chair Lars Klingvall for candidly acknowledging repeatedly the flaws of the SPD's Russia policy. I admire the clarity and fearlessness of Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock when her Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov offered her vodka for the get to know each other lunch. She countered that if a test of manhood was required, she had given birth to two children. <laughs> I have to say, as a person of the female persuasion, I appreciate that kind of thing. And of course, the speed with which economics minister Robert Habeck is decoupling Germany from Russian energy imports is you know, unprecedented in the modern history of my country. Germany is also the third largest supplier of heavy weapons to Ukraine, and some of those, like the high Mars rocket launchers or the Gepard self-propelled anti-aircraft guns, we've all known what these things do now, have been exceptionally effective. We've given shelter to nearly a million re Ukrainian refugees, and public opinion polls continue to be remarkably supportive of Ukraine, even when respondents are asked if they are willing to bear a personal cost. I do believe that deep changes are happening in Germany, and if you don't believe me, I can, I can give you a quote from Anne Applebaum for that. But now for the buts. Yikes, sorry, and there are many. Schultz promised that Germany would finally fulfill its 2% defense spending promise to NATO, but despite a 100 billion special acquisition fund, we are still at 1.44%, and meanwhile, NATO is quietly discussing moving to three. As for military assistance to Ukraine, in per capita terms, of course, we're far behind the balls and the polls, which is, I mean, just embarrassing, right? Although time is of the essence on the battlefield right now, the government has twisted itself into completely absurd contradictions over requests for more heavy weapons, such as tanks. 
there has been a rise in attacks on refugee housing, and a new poll suggests a worrying vulnerability to Russian disinformation. And the hard right AFD's poll numbers are ticking up. We're really lucky that the next elections in an eastern German state aren't until 2024. We've been driving up gas prices all over Europe with our frantic LNG buying sprees and a 200 billion euro offset package to help industry and consumers weather the energy crisis has drawn sharp and frankly legitimate criticism as a Germany first measure from our EU partners. And of course, Scholz having pushed through quickly the sale of a minority stake in the Hamburg Harbor, or rather its operating company, to the Chinese state-owned shipping conglomerate Costco last week, went to Beijing today, the first Western leader to visit after the 20th Party Congress, accompanied by some very triumphant CEOs and a barrage of criticism from the media, his coalition partners, six ministries, and the head of the Federal Intelligence Service, never mind our allies. Now, Schultz is already flying back, and it appears that he took some of the criticism by heart, too hard, and addressed issues of human rights, Taiwan, economic coercion, and market access issues. And I think most importantly, he has secured a public message from China that it is opposed to escalation in Ukraine and threats of nuclear weapons. So, so far, so better than feared. But he will still have to allay allied concerns that Berlin is once more trying to have it both ways. In a speech last week by President Frank-Walter Steinmeier encapsulate what Thomas Kleiner Brockhoff on Twitter called the good, the bad, and the ugly of the Zeitenwende. He said, any peace must be on Ukraine's terms, blame Putin, told Germans to prepare for hard times. Good, right? This is what the president failed to mention. We were willfully blind to the, to the signs. We refused to listen to our neighbors on Nord Stream 2, on execution-style killings in Germany, on financial corruption, our energy dependence on Russia, free riding on American security, and ignoring the signs of China gearing up to weaponize our trade relationship. By ignoring those warnings and refusing to stand up to Putin, we enabled his aggression and earned the lasting distrust of our allies. And rather than the benevolently herbivorous hegemon and anchor of stability we like to think we are, they think of us as a deeply unreliable swing state, always on the lookout for the national economic interest and quick to take mortal offense when called out for blaming others for problems we have created ourselves. Was nicht sein kann, das nicht sein darf. Worst of all, Steinmeier provided no sense of urgency, no strategic context for what was happening except headwinds, as though strategic competition and worse were just bad weather and no agenda for change. So here are a handful of modest, modest proposals. And to reassure you, I am really now nearly done. Germany, of course, has to lean into the defense and reconstruction of Ukraine. We need to develop initiatives to regain the trust of our eastern neighbors. We are both dependent upon and responsible for the security of Europe in ways that others are not. And so I think specifically we ought to push for a Europeanization of energy policy and of defense policy. That, again, if you don't want to take my word for that, Radek Sikorsky, former Polish foreign minister, just said that in a speech in Berlin. Germany should validate the trust and extreme patience of the Biden administration by taking on a greater, greater burden in alliance, deterrence, defense, and resilience. It has to actively reduce ex its exposure to geopolitical risk from China. Can I just say, I've met a lot of bank CEOs recently. I haven't, I mean, I, in fact, I haven't been asked for advice by, by this many um, you know, industry types in, in my entire life. And the recurring, I mean, the recurring sentence I keep hearing is, you know, we used not to think about geopolitical risk at all. <laughs> and I, I, find that, I, I find that so staggering. Um, I mean, it does explain some things. And of course, we should work with other free democracies to create spaces for rule-based order and persuade hedging middle powers that it is in their interest to participate. Emphasis on work and persuade. And finally, we must, of course, make our democracy more resilient against interference and disruption. So to return where I began, Ukraine is not just fighting for its freedom, but for ours. It is not just Ukraine that is in great peril. We are too, because its enemy is ours as well. When we defend Ukraine, we are defending ourselves and the principles we stand for as free democracies. So I have learned the hard way to appreciate Judith Clara's skepticisms and her warnings of humans penchant for cruelty. But I refuse also not to hope that we could deserve Guido's faith and optimism after all. I've learned from my Jewish friends 
to say what to say when someone of their faith dies. May his memory be a blessing. And it means that by commemorating a person, we keep their goodness alive and we carry on their legacy. Guido was and continues to be a blessing for us. He unites us in memory, in friendship, and shared convictions. And I hope that one day we will be able to raise a toast to Guido and say, see, we did this. Thank you, Guido. Thanks to you for inviting me to speak and for listening to me. That was great. Thank you. Okay, what did you like me? <laughs> Thank you very much. Those were remarkable and uh, th very thought-provoking remarks. Um, uh, I think there's a lot that could be said, and uh, maybe some people here would like to say some of it. Uh, so we have a <laughs> little bit of time. I have no uh, doubt of that. Yeah, uh, well, <laughs> a little, we have a little bit of time for questions and comments. I would uh, ask you to keep your comments in particular uh, brief. Uh, there are two microphones, one being set up, one here. The other there, this event is being recorded, so if you don't want your spouse to know that you're here, you probably shouldn't come and ask a question. But um, uh, otherwise, uh, by all means. And maybe I could begin by asking you the first question, uh, uh, Constanza. Um, uh, the Financial Times reports that recent uh, surveys in Germany suggest that when asked uh, whether uh, Germany should uh, take a leadership role on the military side in Europe. 60% uh, of Germans say no, it shouldn't. And I uh, wonder if you have thoughts about uh, why that is, um, whether it's a problem or not, and uh, whether we could expect that to change. Well, um, by way of anecdote, I remember Jim Cooney, then the administrator of the McCloy program when I arrived here in 86, introducing us to the rest of our class, uh, us fourth generation of McCloys, um, and saying that this was a fellowship where, whose membership had been chosen for their leadership potential. And we were all horribly embarrassed by this, um, but I was the one who got up and said, we really don't like that word anymore. Um, Harvard spent three years educating that out of me. Um, but um, I did, however, never take the famous um, Heifetz leadership course. Um, the early generation of McCloys were violently divided over whether it was okay or not okay to take that course. Uh, that just by way of historical memory. Um, I actually think, you know, to be honest, that this is changing and that it is part of the deep changes that I was referencing. And, and I don't want you to think that I'm patting myself or us on the back for this. Um, much of this is because of the just enormity, the, atro the atrociousness of what Putin is doing, and because I think he has no way of stopping. I don't think Putin, uh, I don't think it would be very healthy for Putin to stop, actually. And so I think this goes on until it ends, mm -hmm. and it won't end for a while. And I think circumstances, as is so often the case in Germany, will force us to change. But I see also people responding in the surveys, in conversations that I have, and understanding that we have over decades and I know from what I speak, because I was you know, defense and security editor, uh, you know, underfunded and disinvested in our armed forces. Mm -hmm. I mean, your crystal ball is no cl clearer than mine, but um, what do you think the effect of the Ukraine war is on this? I could see an answer going in either direction, right? On the one hand, Ed, uh, as your uh, remarks pointed out, uh, it makes the threat so clear that you would think it would uh, encourage larger numbers of people to think that uh, Germany needs a robust military posture and indeed perhaps a leadership role in Europe on that front. Uh, but uh, given the high costs that Germany and other, some other countries mm -hmm. in Europe are paying, costs which I think in the U.S. we often don't fully recognize because we don't have very many Ukrainian refugees, whereas there are hundreds yeah. of thousands in Germany. Yeah. Uh, what do you think the effect of I mean, this, you can answer this question, it's of course unknowable, but what do you think the effect of the Ukraine war will be over uh, time, especially since your remarks emphasized how prolonged this uh, conflict might be? I mean, I, I think that is part of what is already changing. Um, and if you, in fact, there is a uh, fresh poll out conducted by 
the Sociological Institute of the um, German Federal Armed Forces, uh, who, when I was a reporter, um, so carefully hid its reports in a, in a steel uh, in a steel cupboard that its um, its researchers once contact contacted me clandestinely to inform me about the results of one of their surveys. And I gather that's no longer the case, and that's good news. Um, but I, I think that there is, I, I remember, I mean, to be honest, I, I took on uh, defense and security um, at Dietzai, Thomas will remember, and Martin will as well, um, after, in, in, in a sort of distinguished lineage of, uh, of men, Thomas, uh, Theo Sommer and Christoph Bertram. And I always used to joke that it was parked with me, a lowly female, so that they could have six more months to search for a guy you know, who could do this. But it was deeply unfashionable at, the unfashionable at the time. And in fact, a lot of my colleagues looked askance at me and made jokes about my being interested in the military. <laughs> and I used to say, listen, you sent me to Rwanda and to the Balkans. Um, and, and frankly, I have good reasons for being interested in this shit, and so should you be. Sorry, forgive the expletive. Um, but the, um, I, I, I sense, you know, again, I was mocked and sort of condescended to at the time. And it seems to me that that is completely changing. I'm, I'm now a member of the, of the Civilian Advisory Council of the Bayern Inre Führung of the Bundeswehr. I have friends in the armed forces, um, and, and yeah, they, they report a very different mood. The, the problems, the, the very real problems of um, improving our defenses are structural and, and how are related to the sort of insane path dependencies. And yes, the, the really pathological uh, transatlantic defense industrial relationship in which I think it is not unfair to say that America and uh, America was perfectly happy to encourage a certain degree of dependency on the part of Europeans. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, and so how we are disentangle ourselves from all that and provide for a European security that helps keep Amer a benign America's back free even that has concerns elsewhere is a real issue. And it has a great deal to do with economies of scale. And so I'm sorry, I'm going down the rabbit hole, hole already. I can sense that. But, but that is, that is, it's, that's real, and that's very hard to change quickly. OK, great. Thank you. I mean, let's broaden this. Um, yes, uh, go ahead. I'm, I can barely see. Is that Andreas, Andreas Bush, Bush there? Yes. You have to come down to the microphone. Yep. So that would be, uh, and indeed, if people come Over down here. to the microphone. I'm, I'm going to take the liberty of already standing at the microphone. To oh, ask I'm, a question. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't. That's okay. I didn't, I, yeah. Yeah. It was very high. So, so was Andreas, hold on a second. Yeah. And uh, why, don't, why don't you identify yourself and Thank go you. first? So I'm Alexandra Vakru. I'm the executive director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Oh. And uh, you're interested in the military. You've laid out all of the questions extremely well. And so I have to ask you the question that I'm always being asked right yeah. now which is, we know that Ukraine cannot win with the equipment that we're providing them now. And we also say that Putin represents an existential threat, not only to Ukraine, but to Europe. So is then the only solution to better arm Ukraine so that they can defeat Russia and push them out? I, I thought that was what I was saying, yeah. Absolutely, I, I, I am saying that. The, one of the real problems is, is that it's frankly, I mean, the Germans have given the Ukrainians a hell of a lot more munitions than they like to say because they're so exquisitely squeamish about what we're doing. But um, we, of course, are in peacetime mode when the, the production, not just the, the supply, but the production of ammunitions is in sort of just in time. And you know what? That's also true for the US military. Um, the US military is having a really hard time gearing up to produce the, the ammunition that Ukraine needs now. And um, now we all know from World War II, you know, what um, allied countries can do if they need to. And they did, amazingly, um, with the help of the, you know, many rosy riveters. But um, I, we might be heading in that direction, frankly. And I think it's, it's really important for governments to understand that, that that is an issue that we need to address very quickly. It also appears, sorry if I can follow Please. up, that it's not just a munitions question, but it may in fact be that troops need to be put on the ground, right? Oh. And the problem is that if you say getting Russia out of Ukraine means World War III, yeah. which it uh, does, I know. I know. then what do we do? Uh, well, I'm, I knew that somebody here was going to ask that question. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, it's the first question. Um, yeah, why don't we have the reception now? <laughs> um, <laughs> 
You can drink heavily afterwards. I will. I intend, believe me, I intend to. <laughs> but, um, oh, Animal House, great movie. Thank you for referencing that. Um, uh, look, so I'm part of a generation of German journalists that was, as it were, introduced to the real world um, via actual genocides. Um, I was one of a very small group that covered Rwanda. Um, many more covered the Balkans, but I ended up writing about the war crimes tribunals for both and the creation of the International Criminal Court because I have a law degree. And so I have form, and I've been in war zones, and I've been at mass graves, and I've been at war crimes tribunals. And um, to me, what Putin is doing here is, is not just profoundly offensive to everything I believe in, but it was well beyond what happened there. And the only reason we know that is that we're not intervening militarily is, I think, a chastened sense of our own abilities in Iraq and Afghanistan and the fact that Russia has nuclear weapons, right? But I would not exclude that it comes to that because I don't think that Putin is stopping and you probably know that better than I do. And so, again, um, I would much prefer that it doesn't but I'd, I'd like to think that somewhere there are strategic planners, and not just in this country, who are thinking through worst case scenarios and saying, what would we do, and what would consent of the governed mean in that case? How would we make that case? Okay. Right. Andreas, I think you were next, right? Andreas. Thank you. Um, First of all, Constanza, many thanks for this great talk. Uh, very uh, detailed and uh, f full of um, emotion, that was quite clear. Um, the challenge that you described has been met successfully in the past. And the question is to me, what has changed and can that be repeated? Um, foreign policy elites um, used to be um, um, tightly knit. You mentioned Theo Sommer, you mentioned Christoph Bertram. Um, say it, male. Yes, we, we, we have Daniela Schwarz is in the, in the audience, I yeah, think. Yeah, but Daniela's you younger than I am. <laughs> and let's you were saying let's used not to be. make it about gender and age. My question is about um, the changes that are, are underlying um, perhaps um, the response of the public uh, and the party systems that, for example, in the German um, um, system are now quite different. Uh, there is much more demand for uh, responsiveness for democratization, and you mentioned Judith, Judith Schla uh, before and her skepticism. So my question is, can that, can that cohesiveness of a national uh, foreign policy response, and you mentioned how shocked Germany reacted, and particularly certain parts of it, of, of its party system. Can that be repeated, or is the cohesiveness of a foreign policy response a victim of the broadening of participation, of democratization, and the demand for responsiveness? That's so, my question. I know it's, it's a really good question. It's also an incredibly wonky question and one that has so many variables. I would just say to you that during the Cold War, that you know, your proposition that it used to be easier didn't have to be tested, right? Um, and it's being tested now. Um, I recently learned a great expression from our friend Eckhard von Kleden, Thomas, um, who said his grandmother, his grandfather used to talk about Übernächstenliebe, which I think is a fantastic term, and it's, I'm sorry, it's almost untranslatable. It means loving the, the neighbor of your neighbor mm. more than your neighbor. And it always seemed to me that the Germans were much better at loving the Tibetans than they were at loving the Kosovo Al Albanians, right? And, and I thought that that was a little bit of a problem. Um, but you know what? With globalization and modern social media um, and the most televised war um, that we've ever seen, um, these things are coming closer to home in ways that they didn't used to when, when I went to Kigali in 1994. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you, you, you will remember that. I was, you know, <laughs> I had just started as a junior reporter at Die Zeit, and our Africa, legendary Africa reporter was on vacation. 
Um, and my um, Dieter Bo used to say to me, you're very young, the editor is on vacation, and you have much to learn. And then CNN came into Kigali on May 17th. I remember that to this day. And then the Monday afterwards, it was a Sunday, and the Monday afterwards, people said, okay, we need to write about this. This is how, how important uh, the sort of coverage is in bringing things closer. And I think that, yes, it is more difficult to organize the consent of the governed, right? And yes, the fragmentation of our publics, the polarization, uh, the creation of what my Brookings colleague, Jonathan Rauch, has called epistemological uh, civil war, um, all of that complicates that. Yeah, and the volatility of politics and the, I mean, the, the structural um, impediments to elected policymakers actually delivering outputs. Yeah? That is all very, very real. But it seems to me that with cataclysmic events such as this one, th they managed to overcome even those obstacles. And I suspect that if we go on seeing war crimes and crimes against humanity, um, that consent of the government will be slightly less difficult to achieve for politicians than you suggest. Yeah, even though, I, I mean, your, your, your doubts are very well taken. And we hope that uh, being a foreign policy specialist will in the future be helpful in uh, as a ca career thing Always. in we're, German parties, which so far it yeah. hasn't, I think. <laughs> no, I mean, look, uh, but that, I'm sorry, that is true everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I everywhere, in every party, whether it's in Germany or, or in the United States Senate, the guys who are women who care about foreign security policy are, are seen as the, the dorks, right? That's not how you get votes. That's not how you get reelected. Um, it's a frankly an obstruction to fundraising and, and, and stuff like that, right? Uh, but somebody has to do it, so here we are. Okay, thank you. Okay. That, that, I, I imagine you've encouraged several people in this room uh, who are studying foreign policy. Please do. Uh, <laughs> Please I, do. I have, um, I'm going to start with Stephen Collignon and then go to the gentleman here, and then I've, I've seen you at the back, and there are two people at the back, if that's... And if, and if I'm not seeing anybody gesticulate more wildly at me. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Collignon. Well, thank you for this presentation. I totally share with you the view that we need to arm Ukraine more and help them to stand up to it. But could I ask you to say a little bit more about the unthinkable, the nuclear threat? Sure. And in particular, it seems to me that if we give in on that, and there's a huge public opinion view that one should not go too far, mm. that this will be the beginning of an enormous proliferation across the globe of, of nuclear arms and nuclear uh, uh, armament for the simple reason that North Korea, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, and I don't know who else, they all will know if you have nuclear war, nuclear arms, you are safe. Of course. And so aren't we at the point of John F. Kennedy that we have to say we confront this mm. to the ultimate? Sure. Uh, I am not going, I, mean, I think Graham Allison is not in the room, but I'm not going to go to the Cuban Missile Crisis anyway. Uh, and I don't think it's necessary. Um, I think it's been made clear to Putin by representations from Western capitals, not least Washington, D.C., that to quote Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, the use of nuclear weapons would have horrific consequences. Now, footnote, um, the threat, the consistent threat, and the mucking about with the, the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, and the false flag allegations that Ukraine might be developing a dirty nuclear bomb, the, those already are civilizational normative breaks, right? So we're already at a point where non-proliferation around the globe is hanging by a thread. Um, I'm not going to go into the back and forth of whether Putin is bluffing or not. There are people who know that much better than I do, but there's a really good piece, I thought, by Hans Bindendijk, Sandy Verschbau, and Julian Nedley French um, recently um, on, on the pros and cons of, of, that, of that hypothesis, which um, I'm not going to bore you with. Um, 
the, and I honestly, you know, come down on both sides several times a day. Yeah. Uh, this is really hard. But, the, but I think it's important to note that Schultz secured sort of one really important thing out of his visit to Beijing today, which was to get the Chinese to say publicly that they would disapprove, not just of a, an escalation unspecified of the war in Ukraine, but of the threat and use of nuclear bombs. Yeah? I mean, if anybody can tell Putin, and I'm not sure many people can tell him anything, but if anybody can, that it would be Xi Jinping. Right? And if that, if that was the only thing to come out of Scholz's visit, then I'm, I'm for it. Right? Now, does that mean it has a lasting impact? We don't know. But it is a good thing because it put up a red flag. Yeah. But of course, I mean, you know, if, if a nuclear bomb gets used, all bets are off. It's the end of global non-proliferation regimes. And everybody scrambles to get a nuclear weapon. And let's not forget, it was the Ukrainians and the Belarusians who gave up their their nuclear weapons freely of their own accord after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, for which we should applaud them today and see where it's gotten them. So. All right. Uh, you should uh, tell us who you are. Oh, Jim Sheehan, a friend of uh, Guido's from New York City. Uh, energy transformation and its pace. Winter is coming. How do you see that further down the road and also the effects on Russia? Game of Thrones really has a lot to answer for. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it, but hey. Um, I actually think that this winter we're fine. I mean, Putin did us all a favor by terrifying us in spring, That's right? Fair. And it gave us a lot of time to both decouple and to fill German gas storage. It used to be the Bundesnetzagentur, the Federal Agency for Network Protection, I think it's called in German, was a sort of, uh, you know, an, an agency that lived a, a sort of discreetly a, a life ignored by most German citizens uh, in the backwaters of German policy, making, policy makings. And its tweet threads are now, and its daily reports on the state of German gas storage are now avidly read. Um, I am happy to, to report that our gas storage, I think I read yesterday in a tweet, are 99.3% full, and they are the largest um, storage units in Europe. Um, and, but I will also say to you um, that that same gas storage um, nearly was sold off completely by then economics minister Zygmunt Gabriel to the Russians, uh, then was taken back. Um, I think nationalized is probably the right word to use. Um, and those, the entirety of our storage facilities, which are the largest in Europe, are enough to last us for two months of a hard winter. And that is without us providing our neighboring countries with gas, which I think, uh, you know, at the point that we are, um, they would have every right to expect. So we are probably okay for the winter, given, um, you know, that we now have sort of, you know, building LNG terminals, we have struck deals with unsavory non-democracies, to get their gas, and I'm, I'm not naming, I'm not, don't mean Norway. Um, we, we, all, we all love Norway now. Um, we have a, all of Europe has a total love affair with Norway. Um, but it is the next winter is what we need to worry about. And frankly, as the point that I was making earlier, I think that we, if, you know, one of the many, many things that we've learned about Europe is just how completely cack handed our energy policy is and our uh, energy infrastructure. Um, the Spanish for the longest time wanted to sell their considerable, and they have the largest number of LNG storage ports in Europe, but the French wouldn't let them run the pipeline across France because the, because the French wanted to privilege, privilege their nuclear industry, half of which has been in maintenance over the summer, right? Nice going Europe. So, and so now, now we're at a point where, and I think this is something that the Germans actually did push through, uh, the French have finally gracefully acceded to building a pipeline across their territory so that Spanish LNG can go to Eastern Europe. And that's progress, right? But, you know, I think clearly what we need is to, is, is to treat this as critical infrastructure, Europeanize it, uh, improve it, update it, protect it, 
and and I think the the next step here is is you know to look at pricing mechanisms. I was saying earlier that of course we 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 help the gas price spike with our frantic buying sprees, right? Thank you, Germany. So so there is a lot of work still to do, even if I don't think people are going to freeze. And I will tell you one other thing, if I may. Um, the, the, the wife of a the widow of, a, of an, another old mentor of mine who died of cancer during the pandemic, um, I sort of talked to her regularly um, on, on you know, FaceTime, and um, she is living in a sort of assisted living home, and she told me recently that she went to lunch with a, her, her neighbors in, in the home, and that they'd all said, you know, and of course we will, wear, we, wear, we will wear sweaters in the winter. That is what we're gonna do. If that is what it takes to keep Putin at bay, we will, well, you know, we can all make sacrifices. And I, I don't mean to, to in any way diminish that. I thought that was um, very sincere, remarkable, and, and, I, and I think um, there are a lot of people, you know, who are quietly doing their bit. The, the other thing I want to say, I'm sure all of you, like, you know, like me and, and others here, um, sort of somewhat obsessively, the French would say maladif, uh, sort of follow, Follow the, you know, the idiots who have been prancing around in German talk, talk shows, you know, uh, saying we, you know, Ukraine needs to take care of itself and all that stuff, and prancing around on Twitter and assorted other forms of social media, right? The people who are the loudest in the German debate are the people who have the least policy-making powers, and it's the quiet people who are doing their thing. And I, I feel like I've been meeting a lot of quiet people who are doing their thing and contributing, so I'm sort of reasonably optimistic for now. Thank you very much. Yes, gen uh, gentleman in the aisle up there. Um, who else here? Okay. Okay. Hi, uh, Grégoire Jaco. I'm a researcher at MIT. The war in Ukraine has united the EU on some fronts, but also divided it on others. I'm thinking of the military policy and energy policy. And in particular, as we could hear it here, uh, the French and German relations are reaching warring lows these days, and this is a journalistic euphemism. Uh, and some people would say that actually, Germany's recent choices are just officializing something that was clear, that Germany has the means, the credibility, and the power to lead alone. And so I was wondering to what extent you think that this French and German tandem still makes sense, and how we should rethink its purpose internationally, for example, with regard to mm. Ukraine, and domestically? Yeah. Well, look, I'm, I'm going to give you a very short answer to that. It, yes, the, le couple is in trouble. I mean, that's very obvious. The French are really, really pissed off at us. Yeah. Um, and I understand some of that, but not all of it, I have to say. Um, the, oh, that's a good idea. Um, the, do we have, there's more here. <laughs> I'll drink from the jug, glasses. it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure there are more glasses if anybody needs them. But, um, I, look, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the era in which the, the Paris and Berlin could presume to tell the rest of Europe, you know, what to do or where to get off are, are self-evidently over, right? And, and I don't want to live in that kind of Europe. Um, do I think the polls are being particularly helpful at this point? Um, probably not, and we could spend a long time talking about that. But I do think that we need to have a much more inclusive and much more respectful and much more empathetic relationship with the periphery nations of Europe. And that both the Germans and the French have been somewhat egregious in sort of completely failing to signal that they understand that EU and NATO enlargement has pushed their security problems to the periphery from their borders where they were during the Cold War. Certainly that was the case for Germany, right? And that therefore we have a, you know, our power, our geolocation, and, and a couple other things, including in the Germany's case, our actions, um, you know, give us a, a heightened responsibility. And frankly, you know, I, I sort of, the farther west you go in Europe, um, the harder it is to make the case that Ukraine is actually something they should really care about, right? Mm -hmm. that, is a, that is a thing, and, it's, uh, and it concerns me. And I think French security elites have the same issue, although I think they are slightly less worried about the consent of the governed, um, except when they are demonstrating in yellow, in yellow vests. Sorry, that was an anti-French joke, I take that back. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that was true, thank you. Now, now, do I understand that the three of you are waiting to ask, uh, make a comment? Oh, I see, okay. And who, who else do we have over we here? We have so another 15 minutes, right? What, we, we, oh, we've got time. 
So go ahead, please. So identify yourself, please. Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Maxim Bogdanovich. I'm a junior at Harvard College from Minsk, Belarus. And uh, I would like to quest, ask a question on Belarus and about European policy towards Belarus. Currently, I see there are potentially two main tracks that Europe and the United States might be considering. My, one being providing an off-ramp for Lukashenko being the dictator over the last 27 years uh, in Belarus, trying to drive a wedge between Minsk and Moscow to help uh, in resolving the crisis in Ukraine. And the second, on the other side of the spectrum, might be to assist the opposition with and do everything to put pressure on the Lukashenko regime with the implicit or stated goal of trying to overthrow it. Mm. And uh, in, on this spectrum, where do you think the right European and maybe broadly Western policy mm. towards Belarus should be? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, regime change, huh? Um, <laughs> That's gone really well for us in the past. You know, Maxim, good to see you again. Um, uh, you know, and you know my sympathy, right? Where my sympathies lie, not with Luca. Um, I would like to see a state of affairs where the whole sort of autocratic, brutal, savage house of cards that, that Putin has built for himself, you know, crumbles. Yeah, and these guys sort of run off into the shadows or, or are brought to trial by their own citizens. Yeah. Um, and my preference, you know, as a German, and having written about war crimes tribunals, you know, we wouldn't have had our own war crimes tribunals hadn't the Americans and the Soviets and the French and the Brits held the Nuremberg tribunals for us, right? But they needed to completely defeat Germany before that. Um, and then it still took us 20 years and a very determined and very courageous and very lonely Jewish prosecutor, Fritz Bauer, in Frankfurt for us to get our own Auschwitz trials off the ground in the early 60s. Um, and I deduce from that and from conversations with the generation of my grandparents, to put it carefully, um, that it is important for that kind of change to not come from the outside. So I think what we, which is not to say that we shouldn't help, you know, massage it along. And I think what, what <laughs> that I would really like to do. So I think what we need to figure out is how we, you know, how we maintain the agency of Belarusians, right? And without um, undermining that agency, um, enable them, you know, to seek their own freedom and their own destiny. Um, and I know that that's an unsatisfactory answer to you, but it is one that sort of comes out of my, my own lived experience, which may be very different to yours. And I, and I understand why that's unsatisfactory. Um, but um, can I just hope, I mean, the day, the day that happens, I will crack open a bottle of champagne, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I hope we can have it together, and you and a couple other Belarusians that I know. Oh, you're all, yeah. <laughs> I have a standing invitation to, to Free Minsk. <laughs> we'll crack it up on top of the that. KGB building. I would love that. I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yes, please, uh, tell us who you are. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Nishank. I'm a mid-career MPA student at the uh, Kennedy School. Uh, my question is in relation to China, and just before I get there, I just want to thank you for your rich uh, analysis. Uh, on China, I wanted to ask you, what are, the, what are the discussions that are taking place in the strategic circles in Germany regarding the rise that, of China and the, and the threats that it poses to Germany's strategic interests? And secondly, has there been a much of an articulation about what are the bright lines or red lines that have been identified which would be seen as particularly inimical to Germany's strategic interests. So for instance, would it be the invasion of Taiwan? Would it be the gross um, interference in German uh, elections? Mm. Thank you. <sighs> okay. Um, okay. Um, again, I think, you know, I used to think that a lot of this was very far off for Germans, especially Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific. 
But globalization and, and again, global media have brought these things closer. You know? And the fact that German companies have uh, big car manufacturers that have plants in Xinjiang, uh, in Urumqi and else, elsewhere, right? And that it is, you know, in the, in the Cold War, it was very dangerous and very hard to get reports out of the gulags, right? Um, it is a little easier today to smuggle facts and images out of gulags. Um, and so people no longer have any excuse for not knowing how uh, Uyghurs are treated in China. And the car manufacturers are in a bit more trouble than they would have been during the Cold War regarding this stuff. So I think that has brought these issues a little closer, but I think what has been something of a clincher for all Europeans, not just the Germans, has been the sort of wolf warrior diplomacy and the increasingly aggressive and assertive um, appearance of Chinese diplomacy promoting Chinese interests in Europe and making it clear that China has a Europe strategy. And while it is different, as I was quoting my colleague Tom Wright as saying earlier from Russians, Russians, Russia's Europe strategy is destructive, right? They're decadent. They're gay ropa, so you know, uh, it's actually great to be a Russian and live in Russia. Uh, the Chinese strategy is, no, 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 um, actually the single market and the infrastructure space is actually what we, what we need for our business, right? And for our global you know, physical infrastructure and digital infrastructure ambitions. So the Chinese are perfectly happy for those parts of Europe to function and are not just happy, but able to split us politically and will have become good at splitting us politically when they need us to be split. That said, I think you have also seen um, a great deal of resistance and by the time uh, growing to this kind of thing, and you saw it in the Huawei legislation um, in, in Germany, and you saw it in the fact that by the time Merkel at the end of her 16 year tenure um, pushed through that European investment uh, treaty with China, she was an outlier in the German security community um, and in her own party. And so I, I think that, that there, you know, the antennae are well and truly up. And that you can't really sort of, it's become clear to all of us that what happens far away is actually an issue for us directly, but that it's also actually now happening very close to us and is, you know, is about direct interference in European politics. So I'm, and I think, you know, had we had any further questions, I think the, the you know, the images from the second, the 20th party Congress, uh, um, I think clarified a lot of things. Um, I do sometimes wonder about the, you know, the, the, the stability or, or fragility of, of both the Chinese economy and politics. You know? But the intent is there and the capability is there. And the, uh, I mean, all I've read about this, I'm not a China expert, suggests to me that the, the Chinese have well and truly subordinated economic uh, um, development under um, the empowerment of the national security state and, and China's global ambitions. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, Kvirin Blomberg. I'm an HKS MPA student and also McCloy Fellow. And for full Cheers. disclosure, I'm taking the uh, Heifetz course uh, on leadership. <laughs> um, it's all right. My question is also about China, um, and I think uh, you know the um, kind of new Washington consensus on, on decoupling probably as well as any, anyone. Um, and my sim question is simply, what if we're wrong? What if we're wrong to put um, Xi Jinping and Putin in the same kind of bucket of, of, of enemies? Um, and um, the question comes from the point that um, Sorry. Um, yeah. What if we're wrong, and what if we okay. kind of we, we haven't have not made the the, the necessary well, kind of diplomatic you, you, efforts you, yeah, uh, in the past? Understood. You might have noticed I didn't actually suggest in my talk that that Xi Jinping sees us as enemies in the same way that Putin does, not in the Schmittian sense. Um, at least I don't have enough knowledge of Chinese thinking to be able to say that in with conviction. Um, I think what we're looking at is, uh, is you know, the, the triad of partner, adversary, uh, you know, competitor, competitor. partner, competitor, rival, but, but I think shading increasingly towards the, the, the adversary and rival part. And, and I think if you, I am not, I'm, 
I actually take issue with this decoupling term because I think, I mean, anybody who knows anything about economics, and that was not Peter Navarro, the <laughs> Trump administration's economic advisor, um, anybody who knows, actually knows about America's relationship with China is aware of the profound interdependence economic between America and China, and that decoupling is not just not an issue, you know, an, a realistic option for Europe, but also probably not for America, not, not in the way that the word suggests. Um, which is why I think the new national security strategy actually tries to thread that needle very, very carefully. I mean, and, and in fact, I, I think it's probably right, and, and here I'm treading on slightly thin ground for me or thin ice because I'm sort of not an expert in some of the things I'm gonna now re reference. But there is clearly a, 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 an unresolved tension in the Biden administration's articulations of policy and its implementation of policy and in the political debate around that, uh, both in its own party and on the, G on the GOP side, right? And um, those tensions are pretty complicated. But I think that the Biden administration, at, the, at any rate, is trying to say, um, we have here a very assertive uh, state that has the intent of changing global order to its liking, and in ways that we will probably not like, because they will involve, involve coercion uh, and intellectual property threat, theft and a couple other unpleasant things. Um, but at the same time, we want to make it clear, and it actually says that, that we are not about a new Cold War, uh, not about block building, not about decoupling, or any other of the straw men's that German business likes to carry parade in front of it. Right? Um, at the same time, though, you have the, you have the CHIPS Act, you know, which is being criticized very harshly by, by, by the paper that I write a column in um, as a sort of, you know, final evidence that, that the, the U.S. national security state is subordinating American trade interests to, to the security debate. So on that one, I'm, I think, you know, I, I acknowledge the point you make while saying I think we have to be extremely uh, precise about whom, to whom we attribute what intentions, and then sort of counter, you know, uh, lay against that the, the articulation of, of legislation and its implementation. Um, and I'm not at the point yet where I can make a final judgment on that. So. Thank you. Are there any other uh, uh, final questions, comments? I mean, have you, uh, any topic oh, yes, that we've left please. out? I, you were behind the camera. I couldn't see you. It's, it's, and uh, who is it here? Sorry. Your last comment just uh, prompted a question. Sonia Kaivich, I'm the German Consul General here in Boston. Hi. And um, I know that how, how important the maintenance of a rules-based international order is for my minister, for, for Annalena Baerbock. And I also, but I also know that on many of the issues of global governance that we have to deal with, like fighting climate change, we still need to engage countries like China. So yeah. I would like to know your position on that. Sure. Thank you. I mean, the national security strategy very deliberately highlights that issue as one of the um, numerous issues of global commons and global public goods that um, even a strategy that wants to emphasize cooperation and collaboration among free democracies uh, has to then cooperate with autocracies, right? That, again, it's one of the sort of needles that this document tries to thread in, I think, a rather sophisticated way. But where, again, the proof is going to be in whether, whether we can make that possible. You know, I, it seems to me that, that we are, much depends here on the Chinese. And I, I'm just not enough of a student of, of Chinese behavior. But I will say that on the Western side, um, I think the trajectory of the last 30 years after reunification, where, where we, it seemed that we were being handed world peace and, and, the, and sort of the, the worldwide spread of liberal democracy on a plateau, has, I think, led to a fair amount of very appropriate um, uh, so, um, self-examination and reflection on, on our own mistakes and, and the ways on where we sort of went, you know, off and wandered down uh, a dark alley. 
Um, and we would probably all say today that the Iraq war was one of those and, and that the way we handled uh, Afghanistan and certainly the exit from, from Afghanistan was another. And, and I think that appropriate spirit of humility is one you know, that could enable such conversations. But the question is, I think really, whether anybody in Beijing wants to have a conversation on those terms, right? Also the question is, frankly, what happens um, after the midterms? and to what degree the administration would, will even be able to have those conversations, or well, what happens in 2024? Go figure. Yes, I'll take, I think we'll take uh, one last uh, question Absolutely. from Charles. Hi, uh, Charles de Gunsberg. One, one very last question. Um, with everything that's going on in the world, there's been a lot written about the perils of immigration for Europe, and I'm not talking politically. I'm talking about the combination of Sociopolitical unrest, massive global warming. Mm. There have been tons of articles ranging in numbers from catastrophic to unimaginable over the next 10 years of immigration coming from Africa, from the Middle East, from everywhere into Europe. Is that something that even in today's world is a concern that we should all be, and, and I'm not, I'm asking a question from a pure, this is, this is not an immigration question, no, it's no, a I question it. that yeah. the, the, the population movement could be such hmm. that it could be another untenable disruption. Sure, so a couple points, thank you. I mean, I think it's a very good question, even if a depressing one to be ending on. Um, but, um, you know, the difference, I already highlighted one difference between the Cold War and now, which is why I dislike it so much when people say, oh, this is a new Cold War. Um, there are practically no more, I mean, there, we, there are practically no more obstacles to the free movement of data, ideas, people, and goods, right? Um, walls uh, and iron curtains, not gonna happen. Um, and, and as I was saying, you can't really hide what, what uh, autocratic governments are doing behind gulag walls. Somebody is always there with a smartphone. Um, I mean, I remember interviewing Fudi Tsai, people who had been in Tiananmen Square or who had been in Chinese labor camps and who had you know, uh, hidden, uh, you know, written, written their autobiographies on, on toilet paper and hidden this about their bodies for 20 years and then managed to smuggle them out, right? I mean, those, those, those people had an extraordinary fortitude. Um, and let's hope that we're not gonna see that again. But um, we're also seeing, of course, that Putin is using forced migration, uh, to, they're weaponizing it as a tool to again paralyze decision making in the, in the West. And I don't want to live in a society, and I actually don't think that's physically possible in Europe, where we draw up the, you know, pull up the drawbridges, start building walls again, and where people drown in, you know, ramshackle little boats, which is what they're doing now. I find that, I mean, that, I think, just brutalizes us. In fact, I want to look this up. I had noted this. Quote. This is a quote from Nietzsche that I thought was really good, and that um, I was forgot to name in, um, in my talk. He who fights with monsters should look to it that he does not himself become a monster. Hmm. Right. Um, that's the challenge for liberal democracies. We're looking at we're fighting evil. We're trying to contain it or constrain it but we can't become that ourselves. We have to hold ourselves to different standards. So when you know, the British Home Secretary, Suella Braberman, talks about putting people on planes to Rwanda, you know, I, I, as a German, you know, I, I just, I mean, it sends chills down my spine. I, I find that unbearable. And so we are going to have to find a humane way of regulating migration. And Thomas, you wrote about that in your book about the West. Sorry, I was just quoting your book. Um, and there's a whole chapter about this. Um, and, and, and I think it's right. We have to find a way of regulating it without trying to throttle it. And, and that, to some degree, of course, you know, involves starting you know, where people leave and helping them not want to leave. 
but that ought to have been, of course, the purpose of our development work, and that doesn't didn't seem to have gone so well. So go figure. And Please join me in uh, thanking um, well, uh, Constance <laughs> thanking you. Thank, thank you, thank you all, thank you all for hosting me. I'm really glad that I didn't lose it completely. Uh, that was my worst worry. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful to you. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>